Good evening. Um, today is Thursday, September 5th. Welcome to the school board meeting, the first one of the school season. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance. I'm not going to talk a whole lot tonight, obviously. Um, can I please have the attendance? <clears throat> Mrs. Durgan? Here. Mrs. Giftis? Here. Mrs. Glidden? Here. Mr. Gill? Here. Ms. Casalonis? Here. Ms. Layton? Here. Mrs. Sider? Here. Ms. Caldwell? Here. If you can join me for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance <coughs> to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Are there any adjustments to the agenda for tonight? No adjustments to the agenda. Excellent. Is there any public comment on tonight's agenda items? Seeing none, moving right into the superintendent's report. Okay, um, I thought it would be good to show you the September enrollment figures, and I'll walk you through this, and if you have any questions, feel free to speak up. Uh, so pretty much if you look at the right side, the blue column, just as a reminder, perhaps to the public, every school system always tries to contract with a, a company that would look at predicting enrollment for the future. And um, you typically need that information if you're going to do a school construction project. So on the right-hand column there, that was done, I think, back in maybe a year ago? Yeah. And um, I think Rebecca Wandell. Mm -hmm. possibly did that as well. So that's just looking at the future, what the enrollment perhaps will be as we uh, begin to plan school construction projects. The, the middle column is really the current enrollment that we are faced with in September here. And the minus mm -hmm. or plus in the parentheses is compared to enrollment from last year. So <laughs> for instance, if we take the high school, we're at 988 currently, and we're down about 21 students. Middle school at 698, we're up 23 students. Wentworth, we're at 658, down six students. Blue Point School, 200 students, and we're up two students. Eight Corner School, 242, up 20 students. And Pleasant Hill School, 205, up 14 students. Total enrollment, 2,991, which means we're up 32 students. So we're growing slowly but surely. And that's the enrollment. Any questions about that? Okay. In addition, um, I've asked Todd, our facilities director, grounds facility director, to give an update on the turf situation, and uh, it's all yours, Todd, if you want to speak to that. Thank you. Um, as you uh, heard this summer, we did have a vandalistic event at the turf field, and while my department doesn't necessarily oversee the turf field, uh, it was the school <coughs> surveillance cameras that actually caught the activity, and we were able to preserve that video and give it to the police department. <clears throat> they are still conducting investigation, but I've been given a, a piece that I can read to you so as to not um, ruin any of their investigative activity. So I'm going to read it to you. And it came from uh, Deputy Chief David Grover. <clears throat> the case was reviewed by the district attorney's office yesterday. This was um, on Thursday, August 29th. He sent me this, so last week. There were four people in the truck when the crime was committed. Two adult males, a juvenile male, and an adult female. All three males took turns driving the truck and caused damage at different times during the event. The case is going to the grand jury in October. They will decide whether or not to indict the two adult males on the charge of aggravated criminal mischief. The female will be subpoenaed to testify as a witness. The case against the juvenile male is being reviewed by an assistant district attorney who handles juvenile cases. 
The crime is the same as the adult males, but the process for juvenile crimes is different. And I asked him a further question, uh, and all he re uh, replied was saying, none of the four people uh, are, that are being investigated are from Scarborough, and all indications at this time are that this was a random act of opportunity. He will be able to identify the two males if they are indicted by the grand jury, and he can also ask about identifying the other two to school administration. So it's an ongoing investigation. He said a lot of the evidence is, uh, they left a lot of evidence uh, in, the, in the wake of their destruction. Uh, a tire and a bed liner and phone and hay stubs and things like that. So um, it was it was a pretty pretty long and exhaustive investigation. I think they've made good progress and are feeling confident that they'll have some charges uh, made shortly. Great. So any questions? Uh, the condition of the turf field, if I might. I did speak with Todd Souza, who's the Community Services Director, and his department oversees that. It, all the repairs have been made. Uh, you might see, if you go to a game, uh, some differences in the colors of the lines. Those are uh, glued and painted on. And in some places, they had to replace sections of the turf that were peeled up. And so those sections might look like they sit a little higher than the rest of the field because it's brand new turf compared to the older 13-year-old turf that's existing there. So but it's all playable and usable for varsity sports. Can I just ask a quick question about how like, the safety of the field is assessed like in, in those kinds of repairs and just kind of, you know, I know there's lots of talk about we need a new turf field, so I just yes. wondered what that process was like. No, that's actually a good question because um, initially, their initial quick repair to, to keep some preseason practices going on the ends um, made it so that it wasn't necessarily ready for varsity play mm -hmm. uh, in terms of competition. But the company that they use, which is out of Massachusetts, it's called Turf Prep, um, they did the damage assessment and they made sure that where there were undulations in the playing surface, they used extra infill to try to make it up. And there is actually, uh, I think the town council approved last night um, the proposal to move it ahead to referendum. Mm -hmm. It's something on, on the order of $1.2 million project to re renovate, replace the turf and renovate the track and some of the surrounding facilities. So, but yeah, the, the company that, the third party company that does the repairs actually makes it, uh, certifies that it's right. safe for play. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just really quick. Um, <clears throat> The damage that was done because the I'm I mean, up on I'm on um, the damage that was done because the turf was planned to be replaced. Mm -hmm. Does the damage that was done did that add to the price of repairing or replacing the turf because of damage to the understructure or is that included? Is that all replaced anyway? It's all wondering. replaced anyway. They take okay. it right down, take everything out. So okay. it was it was part of the plan to be replaced. So the so the damage won't impact our budget then. That, uh, our budget, I mean the town. Correct. Budget. Yeah, it didn't increase the cost to. To replace. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. do, you um, do you know if this the the cost to fix the, this was covered by insurance or do do we? I I actually don't know. Okay. I, I know that it was insured through the town's policy, but I don't know if the claim has gone through. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, when I first talked with Deputy Chief Grover about the damage. Um, when they first found um, those who they were investigating, um, he made it sound like they would be asked to make restitution, but wasn't sure whether they'd be able to. <laughs> so, hence the the criminal investigation continuing. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I I think I Joanne Sizemore <coughs> answered this for me before, but I'd like to hear your perspective on the um, sufficiency of the cameras on the entire school campus. If you feel like those. We have what we need to pick up any types of activity like that. I know we were lucky that we were, we got it this time. Do you think that that's taken care of? To be very candid, no. Um, there are no cameras at the turf field or any of the outdoor facilities for that matter. The fact that we caught the video that we did for 21 minutes of the truck doing donuts on the field 
uh, was only by the fact that one of the cameras, <laughs> believe it or not, on the 114 corner of the building, it was a brand new camera that had failed that I had replaced, and the new cameras are so much higher quality, we were able to, to get that footage and identify the type of truck. We couldn't get the license plate because it was too far away, but in investigating it with the police department, I was at the turf field, and one of the things the investigator said was, we really need more cameras at a lower height. So if we were to install them at the turf field, we try to get them closer to the ground level so that you can identify faces, perhaps, or um, license plates. We do have one license plate recognition camera on the, in the district. It's actually at Blue Point School because of their quick drive in and drive out, and there was a security issue years ago with, a, I think it had something to do with a custody issue. Um, and they're remarkably effective and clear, uh, day or night. You can, when a car goes by, you can read the license plate very clearly. It's, they're more expensive, but you maybe only need two in a facility like that, and <laughs> no one would get away that way. Is that something that you're thinking about as we move forward for the next Yeah, I've cycle? actually spoken to both Todd Souza and Mike Legage, and as part of the um, turf renovation track, it's something they, they want to try to add in while they're doing that to at least get a couple of cameras on both sides of the concession building so they can see both the baseball and softball field as well as the, the athletic turf field because it's, it's just a wide open space and there's no fence along 114. So you could literally just drive you know, through the ditch on 114 and get onto those grass fields. Um, the, it, was, it was an unfortunate event that someone, somehow the, one of the gates got left open, which enabled them to just drive right through. And I think it was just human, forgot to lock it, and there you have it. So in the event that you know, we're all fallible, mm -hmm. the cameras cover you, and we, we don't have that coverage. So we need it. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, Todd. report. <clears throat> it's going to be really short. Um, now that school's back, I actually saw this happen twice today while I was on my way to work. Don't forget to stop when the buses stop. Um, I know everyone got used to not doing it, but please do share the road, and if those lights are flashing, please stop. Um, just a reminder, Wednesday, September 11th is the first late start Wednesday of the year. And with exciting news, election day is Tuesday, November 5th, and we have four candidates who turned in paperwork for the two open seats that will be coming up. So good luck to them. And I'm sure more to come on candidate night and upcoming events. All right, moving into committee reports. Policy, really short and sweet. Our next meeting is Wednesday the 11th at 4.30 in central office. Communications. Um, so mine is short too. We um, met <coughs> this week actually. Um, we will be sending out a notice to um, all the staff in the district, but our, uh, the Spotlight Award, um, the first one will be in October and it is open for nominations. Um, any staff can find the very short nomination form. It's like really short. It won't take any of your time. Um, on the internet, like on the left-hand side, if you go on, um, if you go on the internet. Um, the other thing we talked about was um, the fall issue of our district newsletter. Um, we discussed what we would be putting in that, um, and that you can look for that probably in late October. Um, and then, thirdly, we um, are beginning now that the school year has started. We're beginning to identify and pull out some of the return on investments from those pieces in the budget um, that we had talked about and just so that uh, we can see how how that is progressing and that so hopefully the community can also see um, what those what those investments are doing directly in our schools and we have another meeting <coughs> next week but we haven't scheduled it yet Oh, and also, as usual, you can find our information on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Do you have something to add? I do have something to add. Uh, we have our third 
Town Council Joint Communications Committee Roundtable oh, right. uh, coming up in September. It's actually uh, September 24th from 6.30 to 8, and um, it will be at Wentworth. So mark your calendars. All right, long range planning. So there's one obvious uh, absence in this slide, and that is because we're going to spend some time in new business talking about the next steps for the um, budding building project here in the district. So that's not on this slide. But I did want to mention a couple things here about eight corners. Uh, first, the eight corners parking lot that we discussed several months ago is now complete and occupied and used. Uh, and so I wanted to publicly say thank you to our internal stakeholders and facilities that made that happen, as well as the vendors we work with to do that. Uh, as far as the new modular classrooms, the building is on site. As I mentioned at the last, um, the last meeting, we actually uh, have uh, water in the building. Most likely we'll have power by next Monday. Uh, we're currently kind of in a, a waiting pattern, uh, waiting for some special order sprinklers that we need. And these are not sprinklers that you would actually see, as I've recently found out they're sprinklers that are hidden above the tiles, above the ceiling, in the space between the insula insulation and the top of the building. Uh, regulation says you have to have that area sprinkled as well, and since it's not heated, there are special units that have to be used for that. So, like every building process, everything is contingent on the thing that happens immediately before it. Um, so we're waiting on that to finish out the last pieces of the, of the uh, project, which are lights, fire alarms, and propane to be installed for the heat. Um, right now, it looks like we will have occupancy. I put a date up there, but I've been told more loosely to say early in November, assuming that we don't encounter any other unforeseen obstacles that tend to crop up sometimes when you're building something. And so um, the last thing I will say about this is that uh, this has been a monumental undertaking to get this done so quickly. Um, I said earlier in a meeting tonight that I would be intimidated to try and build a garden shed. So it's amazing that this has gotten done so quickly and, and for our students. So um, that's long range planning. Anything else? Um, so last week, or last time I gave you guys the update, uh, we had a meeting with, we were scheduled to have a joint workshop to go over goal setting and budget process with the um, town's finance committee. Um, that happened last week. Um, the results of that were that we should have another goal setting meeting, so that nothing definitive came out of that other than to say that, you know, there's general agreement that just going with this single value point of the mill rate is not going to be acceptable. Like it's too simplistic. It's a complicated process, and we need to have a little bit more of a um, complicated system for evaluating whether or not a budget is is too much, too high, too low, whatever. So um, we have a finance committee meeting next week as a as a school board to determine what we think are reasonable goals for us, um, and then we'll go back and and really set the expectation that the goal of that meeting is to come out of it with some sort of agreement between the town council that we can come back to both respective parties and say, what do you guys think about this? Um, one of the other things that we'll talk about is when I, when I mentioned process and schedule, it's really about making sure that we're clear on what first reading is and what second reading is. So when we come up with a goal, is a goal to achieve that at first reading or is a goal to achieve that at second reading? And I think that was one of the issues that um, haunted us this year because people had different expectations of what that was. So those are all things we're, we'll hope to work out, and that next joint meeting is at the end of September. Um, so hopefully by October we'll be able to come back to you guys with some sort of uh, proposal. Excellent. All right, liaison roles. <clears throat> bus safety. So this is a this is a brand new liaison ship for me, um, and so and I and I don't know that we've necessarily had a bus safety liaison update. Um, since I've been on the board, so just for the, board, the new, new members. Um, number one, I had like a ridiculous amount of fun. Like I really thoroughly enjoyed myself. Um, we all met here. Uh, it was Joanne Sizemore, um, Sarah Redman from the transportation, the transportation supervisor, uh, two bus drivers, and a fellow parent uh, volunteer in the community. And essentially, um, Sarah and Joanne compiled a list of um, safety concerns that came both from the community and from their drivers. 
um, just as we enter into the start of the school year with you know new students who had been added or different bus routes that had changed. Um, and just one by one, we drove around the town and addressed each and every single concern or complaint that had been submitted to either Joanne or Sarah. Uh, we spent a significant amount of time at some of the bus stops really evaluating student safety and bus driver safety and traffic safety and all of it. Um, it was really interesting to talk about you know, what our, our policy currently is one quarter of a mile um, from a bus stop. Like your, your bus stop can be one quarter of a mile plus 500 feet from your home. And so making sure that requests or concerns um, are in line with our policy is, you know, an important aspect of having a school mem board member on the bus. Um, and so we, you know, we assessed each bus stop and um, made a determination and Sarah and Joe will communicate the results of those um, <coughs> back to the community member or the bus driver that raised that issue. And um, so my moving forward and, and doing this, I, I didn't even know this was a thing. Um, and so I would really encourage anyone in the community who has a concern or a, an issue with their bus stop that they reach out to Sarah and you can trust that, you know, someone will, will address it and really give it the, t the due diligence that it deserves. So, yeah. Were they all bus stop safety issues? Meaning? Well, were they issues that may have occurred on the bus or was it just related to the location? It was, it was literally assessing locations of bus stops. Okay. So we had some, it ranged from parent requests, could, could we move our bus stop from this intersection to this intersection? Um, and, or can, you, can the bus pick up at my house? Um, you know, things like that. Okay, thank you. It was, it was not um, on the bus safety, but that's. Yeah, thank you. Yep. April, has, has this been a standing liaison or is this, like you, I know you said that I mean, this is the first time you had done anything with that, is that because it had been not really functioning as a liaison for a while or what's the history behind that? That is a question for Jo okay. um, and since she's not here tonight I won't even attempt to answer that. I do know that Leanne and the other parent on the bus from yesterday had done this before. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what the lab how to account for the lapse. Sure. Um, I need to share that that was raised last year based on um, some snow issues and ice. <clears throat> so we had gone out to do a safety evaluation, but that was the first one that had happened in my tenure. So for 18 months, we had not had one before. So either things have gone really, really well, or Sarah has been able to address them without requiring any sort of a policy review. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Professional Development Redesign Committee. <clears throat> yeah, um, I had an opportunity on August 20th to spend the day with folks that are members of that committee. And just a little bit of um, historical background, this committee um, first met in summer of 2018 as a result of um, staff feedback that was given in terms of how the district um, was spending time on professional development. So this was really a grassroots effort um, based on, um, on staff feedback. Um, it was a collaborative effort between the SEA, the superintendent, the assistant superintendent, leadership team, and staff. And they did a lot of work um, last summer developing a model for professional development. And then this meeting was a continuation of that work. And I have to say, I was quite impressed with um, the work that had been done over the summer last year, some of the stuff that they did this year, and then to take all of that, that information and to really hit the ground running to talk about um, how this, this PD work will continue in the future. Um, just to kind of give you an idea of who's on the committee um, and see how comprehensive it is, um, you have um, three staff members from each phase level, three special educators, three K through 12 allied arts or encore teachers, three support staff members, five SEA leadership members, five administrators, and a school board member. So it's really comprehensive. I think it's a very, um, you know, it's a great representation of the district. And um, what, their, what their main goal is to really 
um, think collaboratively on um, how to rethink the way time is prioritized and utilized within the district around staff development. Um, a lot of takeaways in terms of teacher design time and what that looks like, and, um, but also um, everybody being very sensitive to the idea of while, while we need to give teachers time to do their work and to collaborate and to have a little bit more autonomy in, this, in the professional development they do, as well as the full district work that is more administra in, excuse me, administratively driven, um, a, a, and also an acknowledgement that there needs to be a way to provide accountability for that work. Um, so I think that this year they're continuing on their way to, to develop this, um, this model in terms of making um, productive, authentic, organic, effective use of their time. Town Council. So last night, as Todd mentioned, um, the Town Council voted to approve um, the replacement turf be put on the November ballot. Um, so that will go to referendum and hopefully the town will vote in favor of um, that bond money so that we can replace our turf. Uh, second of all, they voted to approve the formation of a community center committee um, and they have asked that we provide two school board members um, to be representatives, non-voting representatives on that committee. And so I have not asked Leanne how she wants to address that, so I will pass that off to Leanne. If you are interested, I suggest giving her a nudge. Um, when do they need to have the names by? They are, I, they have, they are forming the committee on Tuesday of next week, um, but I would assume that they will schedule their first meeting after the formation of that committee, and then we would need to let them know which of us is going to attend. So we have at least 10 days, a couple days. That's it. I have a question about that. Sure. Um, so I was reading in the leader about the amount. No, you're on. Sorry. I am on. Um, can you, do you have any um, information about the amount that was requested versus the amount that they approved to put on the bond? <coughs> For the turf? Yes. Uh, Todd Souza is um, responsible for giving the town council their bond number. So it is my understanding that Todd approached the town council with a number of one point. Five one point six million dollars um, at their last meeting, not last night. Right. Um, they rejected that, and they asked that it be reduced to one point two five million. Todd went back and had the quote redrawn up. Um, he had the scope and scale of the quote changed to fit the town council's request for a reduction. Okay. Do we have any idea? what has to be reduced in order to meet that number? I do not have those specifics. Do you know, Mike? Yep. Mike, would you? Can you come to the tell us? <laughs> <laughs> to help me out here, Mike. <laughs> um, so the original, we had um, nine or eight or nine uh, bids when the RFP went out. And we interviewed all of them and got it down to four or five people. And then from that, uh, got it down to two. Um, and the original request was for 1.6 million. And that would have been a complete redo of the facility. So tear out the track um, because it has... Um, many many years of layers because it was never it was never ground down in a year it was just resurfaced year after year after year after year and um it was also to you know put in the in the uh in the turf and then also a lot of the implement replacements so for example new field goal posts which you wouldn't think are a big deal but the cement uh, block that's in the ground to hold that post up there. It, it's significant. Um, and moving, you know, redoing the 
long jump pits, moving the um, discus area, expanding the exterior fence um, to what's considered the safe zone, which is a meter from the lane line, um, and things like that. Um, then the what had happened was the community service director um, had decided that instead of taking on the expense of engineering it, which would have been around $50,000, um, we would just put it out to bid and allow the companies to do that work um, as part of the process. So initially about two years ago, we started talking to companies and getting some anecdotal information about what the cost might be. So that number had come in at 1050000 and that's what um, was presented to the board as a working potential number, knowing that there was no engineering as part of that. And so when part of the RFP process was we had met with the vendors at the venue and and then they had come back and done some other work before they submitted their bids. And in that discovery period, they had discovered the extent of the wear on the facility was significant. Um, the, the turf was installed in 2006, and at that time there was another surface put on the track. Um, so it's, it's well past its anticipated longevity. And so the bids originally came in and we got that 1.6 number, which would really be a complete redo. Nothing really extra. There wasn't really anything extra. The only extra thing would have been we asked for power to be run to one of the corners on the inside of the fence area. And the reason being is when we do things like track meets or other events, we have to run a power cord over the track on an extended pole. Um, we run it from uh, one of our buildings overhead to be able to get power. And so we wanted to be able to not do that. <laughs> we wanted to be able to have power inside that fence area. Um, so that would have probably been about the only new thing um, there would have been some things relocated and some new implements, but it wasn't really adding anything new. Um, maybe an addition of um, what's called the protective netting that the, the um, you see in the spring we put up a, a netting at the in each what they call the D zone, which is the the tarred area outside the two ends of the turf. They refer to that if you. If you hear them talk about the D zone, that's the area they're referring to, like where the, where the high jump is, where the long jump pits are. And so in that area, sometimes you've seen in the spring, there's the netting that they put up to stop the lacrosse balls from going into the woods and things like that. One of the, one of the additions was that we were going to back those up and extend them the whole width of the field. Um, so that probably would have been a new thing too, but other than that, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have noticed any like new thing. Um, well then when we had to sharpen our pencils a little bit after the initial town council vote, we, the two vendors that wanted a job, you know, want the job. And so they did a little bit of work um, to help get the number down. What we lost is we lost that netting um, we probably, we, and I say lost, lost in the plan, we still have what we have. Um, so we didn't really lose anything, we didn't gain it. Um, but we're thinking that we can probably talk them into putting the sleeves in the ground still, and then as we can afford to buy the poles, we'll, you know, maybe buy two a year or something like that. Um, we did talk. Um, one of the companies, the company that we ended up going with, we did, they hadn't included relocating the um, discus 
area in their bid. That was taken out, but after talking to them, they added it back in at no additional cost. Um, what we really want to do with the discus pit is move it backwards and put the poles in sleeved holders. And then like during lacrosse, lacrosse games, I don't know if you've seen, but every lacrosse game we have, we have to fold in the sides of the discus um, protective screening so it's out of the way um, of kids playing on the, on the field. And so that damages that and um, it's not really supposed to be moved like that and tweaked like that. And so they're going to put sleeves in the ground, which is a little safer. It'll look more like the netting at the end, so everything will look a little bit better too. And it'll just be set back a little bit further so that we don't have to worry about kids running into it during like lacrosse games, for example. Um, so we didn't really lose that either. Um, we got that back. And I think, I think as we, as we now, now that we've picked a vendor and now that we can begin to move forward, I think we can sharpen our pencil a little tighter and figure out how we might um, at least be able to get the conduit run and the box put in for the power. Maybe not do the final hookup, but put the infrastructure in to be able to do that, to do that job. Um, or we might be able to find some funds in other places to, um, to do that. The 1.2 million does allow us to do the full track if we don't decide to do something different there and, and use some of that money to another, for another thing. So those, those are the decisions that we have to make moving forward now with the vendor is okay, what are we really going to get now? Uh, what are we really gonna do? Um, and do we want to sacrifice one thing for something else? And so we've got to kind of make those decisions and then, then put a packet together that we can then bring to the public and show this is what we're going to do and we need you to come <laughs> vote for it. So we'll put a little marketing thing together and the company will help with that. And um, part, of that, part of that cost, a big part of the cost is the engineering. It does still have to be done. Um, so there's things in there that we couldn't take out. Um, but I think, it, I think it's the right number. It's gonna get us um, a turf field that will have a 10 year warranty um, and a maintenance plan. It will get us um, you know, a new track surface done the correct way. Um, it will get us the, the fencing expanded out to a safe area, a safe zone. It will eliminate the grass um, that's between the, the first lane and the blacktop. Um, so that will all be blacktop now. We won't have to deal with maintenance of of you know weed whacking and things like that um, and we won't necessarily have new field goal posts and um, we won't necessarily have new long jump pits but it'll all be renovated um, it'll, look, it'll all look nice they'll they will move the the discus area because um, with that change is going to come some things when we push the fence back for example this is a little thing but when we push the fence back it's we're going to uh, dead ended on either side of the big bleachers, which means now we're going to have to do something um, under the bleachers on the track side so people can't crawl under there and balls can't go flying under there, things like that. And, and I think it has to be more than just like wind screening, it has to be something more permanent. So there'll be a little investment in that too. So that's a very detailed, sorry, <laughs> overview of uh, of where we, how we came to where we came to, and we did sacrifice some things when we reduced it, and um, that's unfortunate. But um, I still feel really good about what we're going to end up with. The issue now is a lot of work to figure out how we're going to manage all that and try as best we can reduce the impact to athletics. Um, we're, we're, it's going, we're going to have some expense related to it, I'll just say it, because we're going to have to play games someplace, and that someplace is probably going to charge us. 
So if we move our spring season, for example, to play games at University of New England, there's going to be a usage fee for that. Um, so I need to, those are the details that I still need to sharpen my pencil with. My preference is, is that we try to get the vendor to start the project early. It will be easier for me to manage spring sports in a different location than it would be to manage fall sports in a different location. And so, um, so that, that would be my hope, although we, we just still haven't had those um, detailed discussions yet. I think we're going to start that next week. Mike, maybe this is a silly question, but why wouldn't we do it during the summer? Because it's 14 weeks is the install. Okay. And so from the time they start, the, the, the issue is not so much the turf, the issue is the track, because they have to layer it in. So the plan is, the worst case scenario plan is that we're going to grind the track down to the original blacktop, fix that, and then build it back up. The best plan would be that we take it all out and re retar. That's what we really want to do. But if we have to sacrifice that for something else, it's, that's about $100,000. So if we have to sacrifice that for something else, um, but I think that that still be okay because we're taking it down to the original laptop and fixing that and building it back up instead of trying to deal with probably eight layers of redo. Um, so the, the, the trouble is really going to be the track. It's just a time crunch thing because they, they do it in layers. So they black top, leave that, spray the first coat, leave that, spray the second coat, leave that. You know, it's, it's just done in, it just takes time. So you spray it, they have to wait a week. Spray it again, they have to wait a week. And so it's not so much the turf. But of course you can't do activities on the turf when the track is drying. And so they, they, they think the worst case scenario would be 14 weeks. We're hoping that it would be done between six and 12 weeks is what we're trying to push them to do. But I think we have to plan for the worst case scenario and hope for the best case scenario. But are you gonna make sure that the summer weeks are utilized for that downtime? For the for the turf renovation, for the for either, the renovation, either the track or or the turf, just so that we're not. Well, they're not going to. Gonna, space. They're definitely not. The plan was to start June first, okay. and then go into how long it takes. What I'm what what I still need to talk to Todd Sutcher <coughs> about. What and we haven't spoken about this is if I could arrange it where they could start the first of May, and play my spring season someplace else. Um, with that bias time on the other end so that I would be able to have it August 1st. We wanted to, them to start June 1st and have it back to us August 1st. All the vendors said that's not realistic. And so I need to have it back before the start of the fall season, which is the third week of August. And so, um, and like I said, it's gonna be easier for me to, um, make plans for the spring season at a different location than it is to make plans for the fall season at a different. It's going to be harder to find a place to play football games because UNE is using their field at the same time. In the spring, UNE sports, for example, are done in April. And so I could potentially use part of their facility. It'll also affect baseball and softball a little bit. Um, although those fields won't be affected, we won't have access to the concession area, so we'll have to do something about relocating how we do announcing and score clock for games. Um, we'll have to relocate spectator seating for the softball uh, team if we, if we decide to, to do our games there. Um, in the spring and not not relocate those as well but definitely so my plan would be if i can get them to start earlier they would finish earlier but the summer months are definitely going to be used it's okay. yeah. going to be at least 14 weeks or but we're hoping less 
do you know the answer to the question of, of whether the truck for repair was covered was by insurance? Um, the last I heard, it was not covered by insurance because um, the gates, and I'm trying to say this in a kind way, <laughs> but the gates were um, not by accident left over, open. The gates in, in the past, and not anymore, were, perp uh, per were purposefully left open. Um, and um, it was felt but not by the school department, but it was felt by others that we needed to leave gates open for access for, for, for the community. It was felt by the school department that we needed to keep gates locked for safety and security reasons um, and only keep pedestrian gates unlocked. But not everybody felt that way and, and um, but now people feel that way. <laughs> so unfortunately, it takes a tragedy sometimes to realize um, that um, you know the right the right way. I probably shouldn't say it that way. I don't know how it should be done. Thank you. I don't think the insurance is going to cover it, which is why they're going to try to prosecute the the uh, two guys for for restitution, which I'm not sure we'll get. The cost was over $25,000 just for the turf. And they're still not done. They have one more thing left to do. Um, we're able to play games on it safely, of course, as, we, as we've already started, but they've got one more thing left to do to it still, so it's not even quite done yet. Okay. Unfortunately, it was good money after bad, but if we don't, if the vote doesn't pass, it wasn't good money after bad. I mean, we have to have the facility. So, anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mike. Mike. That's great. <clears throat> Student report. You got it. Thank you. Um. So I know that we've only been in school for about six days now, but I still wanted to include some of the fun activities that um, students are doing around the district. And I put some pictures in from the first days of school. So here are some eight corner students. You can see they're all very happy to be back at school. This were, these were pictures from lunch. Um, these are some Wentworth students going to school on their first day. Um, and Wentworth. Yes, that's, that's the, um, <laughs> that is the uh, middle school English classes. They participated in the speed reading activity, which um, they used their summer reading books to um, interact with their classmates and talk about what they did. This is um, from Wentworth. Um, they had an opening assembly, and Ms. Crosby shared some of the slides. Um, the, during her presentation, she talked about how students can respect themselves and others, the new technology at Wentworth, the new staff, the Wentworth Garden, which you can see on the right, um, and some of the different clubs that are available at Wentworth. Um, this is a picture from the Latin trip, which some Latin students at the high school took um, over the summer. They went to Europe to learn about the cultures and language they've been, that they've been learning the past couple of years in the classroom. Um, this photo was taken in Athens, Greece, and they also went to Delphi, Rome, and Pompeii. It's like a really nice trip. Um, here are, this was the seniors' first day of school, our last first day. Um, the senior class officers planned a senior sunrise at Higgins Beach um, on our first day, which was August 13th. We got to Higgins bright and early at 5.45 a.m. <laughs> to watch sunrise with our classmates. Um, and then we had senior breakfast in the cafeteria following that. And I just included some pictures to show the seniors in their senior shirts, which um, we typically decorate in um, with our like, senior nickname and decorate however we want. And then there are some banners, as you can all see in the top left. The senior hallways was decorated with these senior banners. 
was really what cute. What was your senior nickname? Um, I was somehow outstanding. Yes. <laughs> because Good. my nickname is Stan, so I capitalized Stan. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is a picture from the RSVP club, which is reducing sexual violence. Um, they had their first meeting, and they were just coming up with ideas on how to help every student this year. And I want to say congratulations to field hockey for beating Falmouth in their season opener last night. We beat them 3 nothing. Um, and I want to say a good luck to all the fall sports. I know girls soccer is on right now, boys football tomorrow. Um, also, I want to announce that we are holding elections for the junior student representative on September 18th. So hopefully on the board meeting the next day, the next we'll time. have a new junior student representative. Great. And that is all I have. Summer staff recognitions. Yeah, so one of, one of the best things about being a superintendent is you have a helicopter view of all the different moving parts and people <coughs> in the organization and what they do. And during the summer, when people might be at the beach, uh, we have a lot of people working in the school department. And I just put a list together that it, it really takes a whole village to make this organization continue on and to have the opening of school go well. So kudos to the central office staff, custodians, the maintenance de department, the IT department, food service, bus drivers, special services department, the summer reading academy took place, kinder camp, school leaders and district leaders worked really hard to make the opening a success. So, Kudos to them, and uh, thank you for giving me the time to recognize those folks. So, thank you. All right, 11.0, new business. Motion on 11.1 .1 to accept the meeting minutes of the August 15th, 2019 meeting as presented. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. So moved. 11.2, a waiver request for the Wentworth School Cafeteria. <coughs> I'm not sure what that is. Is there something about the um, waiver request? It was a letter. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Right, Kelly? Yeah. This is the letter. Yeah. Oh, the scrapbooking? Yeah. I'm looking. Oh, I'm sure I've got it. Oh, there it is. No, I got it. Yeah. There we yeah. go. We got it. All right. Do I need to read this? Okay. Um, sorry. I'm so good at this. So there's a fundraiser um, benefiting the Maine Children's Cancer Program, and they're asking that we waive the fee. Um, is there a motion to accept that waiver request for the Maine Cancer Children's Cancer Program to use the Wetmore School Cafeteria? So moved. Second. Any discussion? I, this is the same request that she made last year, and I think she's made it for the past few years, and she donates all the money to the mm. Maine Children's Cancer Foundation. We have always waived. <coughs> All those in favor? Unanimous. All right. So last week, um, we had the opportunity to sit in, or well, sit in the audience, um, as town council talked with the folks from the Edge Sports Group about the proposed facility at Scarborough Downs. Um, I know that there was a lot of feeling of things that we might want to say about this proposal, so we open this up to have the board make some comments about um, what the Edge Sports Group could bring to Scarborough Schools and our thoughts on this. So if somebody wants to open a conversation. I'll start. Thanks, so. Um So I think I just wanted to discuss this because, um, you know, the town council is in the midst of creating a committee and deciding whether um, this is going to be a partnership or um, a community center. Um, there's all kinds of things flying around uh, between the town and the Edge Sports Group, which just for anyone who's listening who doesn't know, this is a uh, sport facility <coughs> group that um, is, is planning on building um, some sort of facility at the <coughs> Scarborough Downs location. Um, I, I was under the impression from the meeting um, last week that I attended at the town council where they made a presentation that um, whether the town um, agrees to partner with them or um, do um, some sort of community center, they are 
right now, as of now, still planning on building something, um, whether the town enters into any kind of partnership or not. Um, so to me, it seemed like there were a couple of options. The, the first one would be that the, they would come in and they would build something with no partnership from the town. The second one would be that there would be a partnership with the town, um, not including a community center. And the third one would be that um, they would come in and they would uh, build, in conjunction, they would build a community center as part of their facility um, that the town would run. I just wanted to make sure because we have we don't we don't know which of those three ways it's going to go. I just wanted to make sure that we as a school um, discussed with them separately what it what it might possibly look like to have just the schools partner with the edge facility. I know um, we've already asked for a list from Mike and Kate of where do we send students to outside facilities currently and how much does that cost us? Um, so I guess what I wanted to do was discuss it here and then possibly just formally ask Sandy and probably Mike to contact the EDGE facility and look into what are the options for a partnership, how could we get preferred times as the school district, um, what would it cost, how would we get kids there, that kind of thing, um, just to make sure that we don't lose the opportunity here for our students to have um, some facilities that are close by and um, hopefully you know not having our swimming team out at 10 30 at night practicing in Camp Elizabeth um, so yeah that's kind of where kind of where I was at I mean I think it's really wise mm -hmm. that we start the conversation and think about how we could I mean, maybe a partner, but definitely we should keep open the conversation to see what would it cost for us to bring our swim team, for example, <laughs> to the EDGE facility, should they build a pool? I mean, I was one of the founding members of the swim team, and I've swam at every pool in the area. Um, and what I'll say is that, you know, we swim right now at Cape Elizabeth, and there's a busing cost associated with that. And maybe the EDGE would cost more, maybe it would cost less, but certainly there are other advantages to being closer to home and having other scheduling opportunities. I mean, if we don't partner as a town, it sounds like we'll lose the ability to necessarily have first right of refusal on scheduling and rate. But if we don't have that, we still may have the advantage of having a, a home court, even if it's privately owned. And so I think opening that conversation as a school board, regardless of school district, regardless of what our town does, is, is very smart. And we should get out in front of that, um, even in the midst of these town conversations. So I'm glad you brought this up. So I don't want to contradict anything that you just said, Nick, except I. I think maybe I disagree that um, the opportunity for the school to partner with the EDGE is tied to the town partnering with the EDGE. Right. Um, I think that the town's involvement with the EDGE is centered around that community center. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm very concerned about as I listen to these conversations unfold is that these two things have kind of become very tangled. Um, mm -hmm. it, you know, and, and this is for people who are paying very close attention. You know, I'm right. attending all these meetings. I'm participating in these conversations. I'm concerned that the growing narrative in the community is going to be that without a partnership on the town council side, that somehow the school is definitely giving up our opportunity right. to partner with the edge. And I just, that is not my understanding that that's, you know, right. we still have an opportunity as a school department to partner and have those relationships where we could get preferred ice time or we could get yes. you know preferred court time for our basketball teams and so you know as this which is why I advocated at the town council meeting for school board representation on the community center committee just to make <laughs> sure that these two conversations do stay separate and that we are privy to developments that happen with the community center um, then secondly, I had something else I wanted to add. Um, okay. I, I agree with what everybody has said. Um, I also, I, I, did, I feel like it is an incredible opportunity for us to be discussing and having conversation about. And I, I too worry that um, the town council is is controlling that conversation right now, and we don't really necessarily have a have a seat at the table. And if we're as a board really interested in supporting a conversation about 
a partnership that's separate from what the town council might decide to do in terms of a community center, then I would advocate that we invite Edge here and maybe have a workshop with them and, and talk about what those options might be as we move forward. I totally agree. I would be in favor of that. I also remembered what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> to dovetail with what I, my previous point, my, with my concern and the narrative and, and what's happening in the community is to me it feels as though the community center ask and the town council's involvement with the edge is leapfrogging other investments and competing priorities that the district has. And so my concern and my continued advocacy is going to be for our school building, whatever that is and whatever that looks like. And so I'm going to continue to be a voice, you know, in the, in the town council's ear saying that I feel like this community center, while it, I understand it's an opportunity that is presenting itself, and I completely agree that because it is an opportunity that has presented itself, it is something that they should do their due diligence and look into. I, I want to make very clear that my stance is that this is jumping ahead of some of the other priorities that we have. Um, as a district, and I don't, I don't support um, the community center getting out ahead of, you know, a pending building project that we, that we need. It's needs ahead of wants here for me. I see your point there, um, and whether you agree, I mean, whether people agree or disagree with your point is, I, I feel like we need to pursue this path so that we have options. As a school lose. board or as a town? <clears throat> no, as a school board. Right. I want to. I want to see what a partnership or you know, however that might look between the district and the edge would look, and whether that would be feasible for us to replace some of these outside facilities that we're currently using um, in terms of cost and convenience and times. Absolutely, Hillary. That yeah. you. That is the point I'm trying to make. Is yeah. that. That conversation is completely separate than the, the conversation about a community center that's Agreed. being had at the town council Agreed. level. I, I support that conversation occurring. I will say that I um, have concerns with the stated timeline that was outlined um, at the town council meeting, and I don't want to rush into or feel pressured um, into any decisions. Um, and I also want to make sure that, you know, that the the that there's input from a diverse group with with those conversations occurring. So, I think it's a good it's a good concept. It's something that I support. But uh, I mean, <laughs> how would that occur? I guess is is one of my questions. And number two, I would just state my concern about the the timeline and and, and making decisions that are, you know, potentially have many years implications in, in a very forced deadline. Well, I mean, I know the town council is under some sort of deadline, but as far yeah. as I know, well, I don't know. I don't yeah. know. I shouldn't speak for them. I don't know. My point is that as far as I know, the last I heard that they're building this either way. So I don't feel like we are under any time, kind of time crunch I agree. in terms of, um, making a decision about any of this. I mean, I feel like, I guess, that's why I want the information. And I want to make sure we do get all the information. Like you said, I totally agree with you, Alicia, but I don't think that we have any kind of time concerns in terms of making that decision. I just want the information okay. as to what that path might look like. I, I agree with that 100%. Um, but they're also doing their diligence as a business. Mm -hmm. And they might not have any idea that the Scarborough School Board is interested in having a conversation with them about our options. So I think that it's important that we, we have that communication so we can sit around a table and, and talk about what those options are moving forward. I think just to move this forward, I don't know whether we have to do it formally, Mike, whether you've already done it, but I... <clears throat> If I need to make a motion, I'll make yes, a motion. Please. Okay, so <laughs> make a motion for Sandy and Mike to formally reach out to the edge to understand what a partnership would look like and just have that initial conversation. Mm -hmm. Second. Second. Well, I'd like I would like 
that conversation to, I mean, do you mean that the con that the conversation starts stops then? I mean, no, no, no oh, that starts then. That that it's they fine. just have that conversation and then what report back or yeah. or yeah. yes, and in the meantime. What I've done, I emailed Kate and asked her for the cost information. Yeah, so that. we'll have that as well. Mm -hmm. And then I think come back and let's see where we are. Because um, they may say, to Amy's point, no. Like, we're moving ahead. There's or they may might say, nice, we didn't know that. Exactly. Let's talk. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, and I think that if we report, if we ask them to make that initial contact and they come back to us, they might say they they'd love to come up and talk to you, and that would give us even more information. Yeah. Or they can come back with whatever information they might have gathered, and then we can say, okay, well, here's what else we need to know. I mean, so th I think that the motion would be just the initial just contact. Initial like, gotcha. We're in a time box. Hi, right? Mike. <laughs> I'm gonna put the timer on this time. <laughs> I get it from them. <laughs> we don't have the little button, so. I'm going to unplug this thing. <laughs> um, it's really exciting to hear you talk about it. I will say that we're already way ahead. Um, I have had conversations with them already. I've told them that the school department, regardless of whatever else happens, wants to partner with them. Um, what I think, I think what what might be of value to discuss is at what level do you want to partner with? What we've said, what I've said to them is, um, you know, that we want to be a collaborative partner. And so, and I spoke, I spoke to the owner of the company that did the presentation and also Chris, who is his, his um, manager of this project. And they've actually just, last Thursday sent me um, a, a long email with the plans and asked for me to provide them feedback on so I've been working on that but they know that we want to partner with them they know that what we'd be looking at at the very least is um, preferred time and cost um, and then I guess it would be up to the, to the board how much further you want to go with that relationship. But they certainly know um, that we want to be a partner. They certainly know that we, um, what that means is preferred um, time. They're looking at a pool. They're looking at one sheet of ice, not two. Um, the original plan was for two, but they're, they've cut that back. They're looking at a, a fitness facility they're looking at right now either an indoor tur turf area or um, an indoor turf, turf area for sure. And, um, and then they were talking about courts. They're not sure about the courts. Um, and so my feedback to them is, we, we, you know, do the courts if you got the money. But, um, and, uh, and they're also gonna, interesting enough, they're going to still do the community center kind of concept. There's going to be the, like these other rooms and things to be able to do stuff in. Um, I think uh, the town manager and the community service director are doing a wonderful job doing their diligence and figuring out what's best for the town side. But I can assure you that they certainly know that the school department wants to be a partner um, in this project. If you want to bring them in to talk to, you might want to be prepared to discuss with them what length, what, what does that mean, that partnership? Does it mean just usage, or are you talking about partnering in, you know, construction and management and of the facility? I mean, you know, you'd want to figure out, you know, why would you bring them to come talk to you? They do know that we want to partner with them. And they and they want us to partner with them. Um, I don't know what the savings would be with that. Um, you know, we spend about forty thousand dollars right now on ice time and about eleven thousand dollars on pool time, um, and or, or close. That's very round numbers. <coughs> Kate Kate will certainly give you exactly what we did, but it's in that ballpark. Does that and include busing, Mike? No. No, no, no. Busing is a whole separate. Busing is very expensive for us 
Um, probably less expensive for swimming and hockey because a lot of those practices are after four o'clock. Um, and so a lot of times we're able to get a school bus, you know, like after four o'clock or four thirty, one of our own buses, and that's a little bit cheaper rate than a custom coach bus. Anything that we get um, that we have to leave before four o'clock is typically a, a contracted bus. And um, I don't know that if I see that changing in the, in the near future, hopefully, but. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So we, I know that we used to rent ice time from OA in, in soccer when they had yeah. rinks there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you use the word partner when we rented ice there? We did, in, in, that, in that situation, because we were a partner with them, we were the, we happened to be the only high school there, but they did have a um, juniors program, and actually the Portland Pirates used that facility as their practice uh, rank too, but um, with that partnership, we got um, locker rooms, for example, um, and we got preferred ice time. We did not, the cost doesn't go down. <laughs> Hockey rinks are very expensive, and they're really not money makers. I, I and guess, so, I guess my real question is, what does the word partnership mean to you? Because partnership means to me, like I said, preferred ice time, preferred pool time, preferred time, um, and some other amenities. So, so, so they would probably they would probably allow us um, if we wanted to. They would allow us to build our own locker room as part of that project. We would probably have to fund that, um, but they would allow us to do that. That was the partnership deal we had with MGA. Okay. They were, we were all set to build two locker rooms, for example, MG, MHG, um, but I, I have to say I, had, I told the boosters that we weren't going to spend that money on that at the time, which people were upset about, but I didn't get a sense that MHG was going to be a rink that was going to stay around. Thankfully, we didn't spend $30,000 on a locker room. Um, and so um, th those are th that's what it means, preferred. It's, it would be our, our collaborative relationship, a partner relationship, that we, would, we wouldn't get bumped for a juniors program, for example, out of our time. We would have a long-term relationship, so we would look at signing a long-term agreement a contract um, with, with them for we're going to, they're going to charge us this amount of money, you know, and we're going to be able to have these preferred times and those sorts of things. I will tell, I will say that they are looking at South Portland and Cape schools too um, in terms of high school programs to join in on the hockey side of it. Okay. Um, they, those schools obviously wouldn't join in on the pool side of it because they have their own pools. Um, I think the other thing with the partnership with the pool is also the during the day things we could do with special education um, classes using the pool time, physical education classes using the facility. I think that would be part of that partnership relationship that, that would be a, a vision for me. Is the partnership word, I'm sorry I'm stuck on this, but is that a term of art in your, your <coughs> business? Because to me that sounds like a, an investment, not that we're going to lease out services and sign a contract, but more of we're going to make an investment in your facility. And, and that could be just my lack of knowledge. But Yeah, to, to me it is an investment because we're going to say that, you know, we're not going to go... Um, we're not going to go to USM and play our hockey games there anymore. We're going to commit to being at your ice arena for this amount of time, and we want we want it at this rate, and we're going to agree to do that for the next 10 years or something. So it is a financial commitment, too, on our part, right, right. because once we... Want, uh, it, when you when you buy ice at a place, you you own that ice now, no matter where you buy it from. So whether you use it or not, you're obligated to pay for it. And so um, so if we sign that long term agreement, it is a financial commitment. It is a partnership. We're saying that we're going to use this amount of ice or this amount of pool time for this period of time at this rate. 
The thing I like about that, though, is that it makes it very easy come budget time to be able to say, to know that we're going to, because I can't say for sure, is it going to be $38,000 for ICE this year, or is it going to be $42,000 for, you know, you know, we try to get close to it and we, when we take our best guess, but it's a moving target. It's less of a moving target when you develop a partnership like that. You know that you're going to get three hours every day at this rate. I just wanted to make sure I understood and everybody else understood what, what, what that meant in terms of your discussion. And I think what I was alluding to was if you bring the person in, what you might want to think about is why you're bringing that person in. Do you want to talk about a different relationship? Do you want to invest in the facility for some other reason? I think what, what I need to, what I would like to hear, and I don't know if you guys agree with this, is, and maybe you can help facilitate this, Mike, is what are the, the different options look like? Yes. And then we can have a workshop and decide which, which, which direction makes most sense. But right now, too, I think Alicia's questioning, we just don't really know what those partnerships look like other than the preferred ice time. So maybe if that's something you can take as, a, as an action to facilitate. Yeah, and I'll look at the email they sent me. I haven't deciphered that. Maybe some of those answers are in that, Great. in the facility. And, um, and, then, and then, you know. Perfect. In order to make that the most worthwhile, I, when we have that workshop, if we decide to do that, I would like to invite them here as well so they give us you know they can give us the, the information but yeah. we'll have yeah. questions for sure yeah. so no I agree Sarah I'd like to see what are is there more than one option for a partnership and if so what do they how do they what the tiers or levels what, yeah of, what yeah. are the levels of that what do they look like so okay. that's one of the questions that I have is whether those tiers would include any branding um, where it is in our backyard would it be a storm facility when it's home ice, or are we going to be walking into, you know, as you mentioned, Cape or South Portland? Is it going to fly my former colors? Um, you know, it would be interesting to know what is that break point for us, because that to me would be the investment that we might be on a hook for. And I think you, somebody said it earlier is they are going to build the facility no matter what anybody does. And so I think it can only be positive moving forward for us. I think we're. I think the school department's in a good situation right now with with that with that group because we've only always said in the several conversations I've had with them is that we we want to partner with you. We need to talk about what that means, but we want to partner with you. We want preferred ice. We want preferred time slots. We want preferred pricing. You know, we want to be able to use our branding. We you know, so we want locker rooms. We you know all those things that you can. Excellent. Um, so we have a motion that's yes. on the table. Right. Can I add one more thing to the discussion? Yeah. Just to <clears throat> put an end cap on this. Um, I would request that at some point as this um, discussion um, progresses that our policy committee take a look at our current policies in terms of, you know, usage and busing and all of those kind of things and make sure that, you know, we stay ahead of that and that our policy doesn't preclude some kind of opportunity. Yeah, that's a good point. Good point. Do we want to have any sort of time frame on this in terms of when we would like to get the answers back or are we just gonna? Well, we have a, a motion. Are we with, are you withdrawing your motion? So well, they've already, they've already, right. yeah, so they've already, so we can withdraw, you guys can deny me. Um, Firstly, I think we should. I, I'd like to, can I, can I amend it? Okay, you can amend it. I'll try. <laughs> I would like to amend the motion to state that um, we would like Sandy and Mike to contact the folks at EDGE and ask them to develop um, some different options that we might be able to discuss in terms of a partnership and also to invite them to a workshop that we will have in the near future. If needed. Second. Any discussion on the amended motion? No. Okay. All those in favor? Unanimous. Great. Thank you. And thank you for starting that conversation. Like, this is, yes, thank this you, is a great moment for us. All right. And now, the very exciting part. Because we haven't had enough big conversations tonight. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'll start by saying that these next three slides that I'm going to show you were built before a conversation that terminated tonight at 6 o'clock in the long-range uh, 
uh, facilities planning committee. So I'm going to be bouncing back and forth between these slides and my notes. So if, if I lack in flow, I hope I make up for it in content. Um, so uh, first off, I just wanted to um, say that we've had some great conversations, as I've said several times, with the former members of the Wentworth Building Steering Committee. Um, both myself, or actually all three of us, myself, April and Sarah, have sat in on those conversations. Um, they are a very ambitious, very committed group. Uh, they obviously formed a very unique and very productive bond during their work with Wentworth. Um, one thing that came out of it was that it was a very inclusive process, a process that brought in a lot of the uh, community. And so what we want to do tonight, and what this is going to terminate with, I'll say it right now so you know where this is heading, is forming a committee, a steering committee like that, to start doing some of the work we need to do to address uh, our issues with our youngest phase level in our, our district. Um, in addition to talking with this group, I did want to take a moment to highlight that um, I have personally, uh, at the, and I have cleared this with the chair, of course, reached out with the chair of education in uh, South Portland, because while we had a very inclusive pro uh, project here in Scarborough, South Portland also recently had a very inclusive process when they expanded their high school. So I've, I've talked with Richard Matthews. Uh, I know that's the order it goes, and it's tough with two first names, but it is Richard Matthews. Um, and he has reached back to me, given me his phone number, and I look forward to talking with him and hopefully getting some contacts uh, for the Long Range Planning Committee and probably this building committee actually also to talk about to them about their process to get a little bit of perspective from outside of 4074 because uh, Scarborough can be uh, a little bit insular sometimes in our reflection and so I think it's important that we reach out uh, and kind of round out the input that we've had um, from the Wentworth group which was so inclusive. Um, our goal at this point and what we're looking at is to be on the ballot for a building project <laughs> in November of 2020 or June of 2021 as a fallback, although I'm still optimistic that we can be there for November of 2020. So we really need a steering committee to move us forward. And a steering committee um, it really needs to help round out and direct this project. Because if there's one thing I learned from the Wentworth group as well as other people I've talked to, um, and I think I speak, I don't want to speak for the rest of the committee, but I think we've all heard the same thing, that this really has to be community driven. It can't be driven by the school board, although we definitely will be a part of it. Um, it needs to be driven by dedicated and well-connected members of our community. So for this steering committee, we have four important questions that have to be answered by New Year's Day. Uh, first is, what are we going to build? Where are we going to build it? Who's going to design it? And how do we get wide-scale district and community support? Um, to answer, this, to answer, I won't try to answer any of these questions because it can't be answered yet. But what I do want to say is that this first question, I've said it before, it's a sensitive one, and I won't go into detail on that again. But what I will say is that we have a lot of evidence in place already. Some of it in the form of a 2017 master facilities plan that gives us a lot of data and evidence about what are the most affordable and, and resource conscious ways we could go, as well as uh, giving us some good arguments for how it could affect other and, and support other phase levels in our district. Um, to not mince words, most of that points toward a single consolidated primary school. The question that this building steering committee has to look at is they have to decide, and I think the answer right now is no, they have to decide whether or not that's enough to make a decision and a commitment to that specific solution. I think our data gets us most of the way there. But I think this committee has to take a look and step back, and the whole committee has talked about this, the Long Range Planning Committee, there's so many committees, I'm mixing them up. The Long Range Planning Committee has talked about this. This steering committee is going to have to decide what additional evidence they need, what additional efforts they need, maybe some community input, to help round out and solidify that charge, because we have to commit to what we're going to build before we can decide where it's going to go and, and try to design it, what color the windows are going to be, and all that stuff. Um, so that's kind of the first big charge for this group, um, but I wanted to embellish on, the sli uh, on this slide a little bit and say that um, we're not naive to the fact that most of the data that is public supports a single consolidated school, but I think this group's going to want to dig a little deeper into that, into that charge. The steering committee, the last one, consisted of 12 people, and what we talked about today in our meeting is that we'd like this one to consist of 12 people. And this is what I'm go we're going to ask for today in the form of a motion. Those 12 people will be six people from, that are connected directly with the schools and six community members. The school people would be two Board of Education members, one uh, Todd, 
One time. <laughs> in the form of Todd Jepson. Uh, one senior a leader from our district, probably Sandy or Joanne, so they're not both Sizemore, but Sandy or Joanne. Um, one K-2 principal and one K-2 teacher, um, and then six community members. Uh, we talked a lot about how to really get community members that are invested in this project, have the time to commit to it, and most importantly are connected with this type of work. I said it once this evening, but I'll say it again. I'm a chair of long-range planning, but I, I would dare to build more than a garden shed, and so I'm not going to pretend like um, I'm the person to lead this charge or to chair it. We really need a community member who's invested, who can make this a community-centric <laughs> effort and chair it um, with a sense of knowledge and passion and time commitment. But there's going to be many ways to be involved. Uh, tonight we are asking that we get permission to form an ad hoc steering committee to get this process started. Um, but there will be a larger building committee that will form and flourish out of that group. And beyond that, there will be all kinds of committees that will butt off of that committee, like a parking lot committee or a playground committee, and I'm making these up as I go. But um, it will be a whole tree of committees that will start at the very bottom in the roots with the steering committee. And so I wanted to make that clear that this is by far not the 12 people that will literally decide every detail of the school, but they'll be the folks that will help us answer these 12 questions at the top of the page. I think I already touched on this, but I did want to say that um, it's really important we all know that we have diversity on this committee, that we have committed people on this committee, that it is an uh, evolving and comprehensive process. I can't tell you right now what every aspect of this building committee will be, um, I, I mean steering committee, excuse me, will be because you know we're all still discovering this and, and this type of project is always unique to the time in which it happens. Um, we know there are vast differences between what we're faced with at the primary schools versus what happened at Wentworth five years ago. Um, but there's also a lot of parallels, and so we're thankful for the uh, expertise that have come forward. And so uh, I'll stop rambling at this point and ask that anyone at the, uh, at the Long Range Planning wants to jump in and add anything they think I've left off. But what I would ask is that you know, we have a little discussion about it and then hopefully end with a motion that allows us to get this process going in the form of an ad hoc committee. I don't know that this is necessarily the right time to hop in with this, but one thing that we are going to need to really um, be mindful of because of our timeline is um, getting the word out about this steering committee. So in, in the event that the motion passes, um, you know, we would like to hit the ground running very quickly. And so, you know, if there's something that we can do as a communications committee to get this out, um, you know, that's definitely a top priority for me is casting a wide net, even just for this initial steering committee of 12 people, um, because they have some of the, the most response, you know, they have some of the most responsibility coming down on their shoulders. And so I really want to make sure that, you know, we, even in a shortened timeline that we really, you know, make sure that people are aware that this opportunity is in front of us and, you know, please, you know, express their interest. Nick, did you mention our time frames that were for the... I don't think I did. So yeah. the timeline? The, time, the most immediate time frames that we were thinking of is having um, an initial meeting with those who are interested uh, towards the end of September with the goal of really using that, that as an opportunity to express to everyone sort of what the time commitment is, what the expectations would be, and then some people will probably rise up and some will say, maybe I don't have time for this, um, but either way, we would form the committee out of that session and the f formal kickoff would be early to mid-October. So that, those are our timelines, so pretty quick, but we feel confident that given the outreach that um, the principals are doing and that we can do, and hopefully anyone listening will we'll be able to get some good candidates. And that's what the January 1st-ish deadline for the information to be presented? So for them to do the work they have from mid-October to January-ish, that's like really, that concerns me that that's very tight with those four big questions that you guys have? It, yeah. Um, so I just wondered, like, about condensing it on the end, like, in terms of maybe having it, the committee set by the end of September. And is that not realistic either? I don't know. 
Well, it's tough because we want to make sure we have enough time to get word out to everybody so that people that want to be involved have a chance to respond. Um, but I certainly understand what you're saying. One of the things we talked about is that, you know, we'd love to have all this information together by January, but if this group starts gathering and says, you know, this is going to take a little more time, then we'll take more time. One, the one thing we're all committed to, and we've said many times at our meetings, is that we want this first push to be as organized and successful and, and, and directional as it can be. And so if a little more time makes it more convincing and makes it more robust, then more time it will have. Um, and I, I think that's important. Um, the other thing is, is that at this September meeting that we talked about today at our Long Range Planning Committee, uh, we talked about the idea of really gathering a, probably a, a group of people that we've asked our, our primary school principals to give us some names of people they think would be really good resources, getting some folks interested from the community, and then really having an organic discussion about the time commitments that are involved here, about the scope of this project, because what the last group from Wentworth told us is that when they had that conversation, some people kind of faded in the background and said, well, this sounds really interesting, but geez, I don't know if I can do that. And other people really rose to the top of the pile is having passion and commitment and that's how you find your leaders that's how you find your chairs and so it'll be interesting to see how this forms I think it's going to be kind of organic in the way it comes together um, if it's anything like the Wentworth one was um, but certainly timeline uh, we'd I'd love to see us have those four questions relatively answered by New Year's Day but if time is not on our side and we need more time to be more thoughtful that's what we'll do I'd like to set what we think are optimistic yeah. um, deadlines, you know, and really kind of work on this, the basis that this is an ex that we know that this is kind of a, con a condensed timeline. And, you know, like Nick said, we can be flexible, but, yeah. you know, I, I, I'm comfortable at this point with um, letting the committee know that, you know, we are on a tight timeline for November 2020. And if that is our goal, then these are the benchmarks we need to hit in order to get there. And if at any point during the process they, it becomes apparent that they can't hit those benchmarks, then that's an indication to me that the whole timeline needs to be shifted. And so let's start out with one benchmark and see you know, if we can hit it. That's my thinking. And I think, too, that Nick mentioned ideally we'd like to get it on the November ballot, but we do also have the mm -hmm. June ballot. So. Mm -hmm. Like April just said, if the committee comes back and it's like, we cannot, we can answer this question, but not these three, and it's going to take us another two months, then, like you said, we might want to push the entire timeline and say, you know what, yeah. then November really isn't going to be yeah. feasible. Let's look more towards June. And the other good part is, is I think all four of these questions, I can't think of one of them that we're actually starting from scratch. So the good thing is, is when this group does get together and get going, um, a lot, like I said earlier, a lot, of the, a lot of the evidence is gathered to help us figure out what we're going to build. I think there's still a few questions that have to be answered to completely round that out, but we're definitely not starting from ground zero. Uh, as far as where we're going to build it, we know through conversations and some of our information that uh, municipal campus is tight and probably not a feasible um, op uh, option, but we did talk about it today in long range planning that um, one thing we could do as a board is ask that uh, we revisit and look at a, a, a new wetland study to confirm that our municipal campus is not going to work for us. That'll help answer that question for the committee. Um, and then the last part of it, which is uh, gaining support, um, today we had all three of our primary school district sit um, principals sitting at the table with us, and all three of them voiced support for this project, and I was very excited to see that, and I think that goes a long way to securing that type of buy-in we're looking for, certainly on the district side. So what's motion? You have to make it. Now. You want me to make it? I'll make my own motion? Okay. Um, I move that the Board of Education support the formation of an ad hoc building steering committee to answer the four questions outlined in this slide and uh, um, get us moving toward um, a permanent solution, more permanent solution than modulars to our primary school enrollment issue. How's that? <laughs> Any further discussion on this? Thank you. We guys. did that. We already did the discussion. Yeah, we did it backwards. Fine. We did. Um, I would say thank you guys for all of the work that you put in. I know it's been countless hours um, meeting with people, digging in, um, doing this. Thank you for getting us to this point. And I'm excited to see where this takes us. That said, all those in favor? Unanimous. <clears throat> Great. 
Alright. <clears throat> 11.51. We're in appointments. Special services consulting teachers. And Amy, I apologize. I'm going to ask that you lead most of this. Um, I don't think my voice is going to hold out for all the way through. <clears throat> okay, so what do you, what would you like me to do? You um, want me to... We have the first appointment of for the special services consulting teachers. Yep. Um, we can open it up to have a conversation, and then it's the motion to either accept as it's presented or to table the conversation to a later time. And I'm so sorry. No, so sorry. That's okay. <laughs> so so do you do you want do you guys want to have the conversation first and and then do a motion of what we're gonna do? I think that's a better move, yes. Okay. So um, I I think that um, <coughs> In terms of this, this first uh, request for appointments, um, the, the special services consulting teachers, I think there's some concern around the logistics of, these, of these, this set of stipends because uh, last year when they were on the agenda for approval in September, it was grant funded. And now this year it, it's part of the general fund. And um, it's not part of our collective bargaining agreement. These these consulting stipends aren't in the bargaining agreement. So for me, um, I just, I'm concerned about a logistical um, problem with um, where where this money is coming from. Um, I don't remember it being part of part of the budget in terms of the special services budget. I, I did hear today when when um, when Sandy got that information from Allison, that it was a um, information that was received in July, in terms of um, they realized that the grant money that they had been using in the past to fund these stipends was no longer available. Um, but still, it's like the fact it's not in it's not in the collective bargaining agreement and. It, that just poses a little bit of a, a concern from my perspective. The one thing, um, I agree with everything Amy said, and as a, a member on, on negotiations, I completely agree. It's, it's concerning that it's not um, in the collective bargaining unit, uh, agreement, excuse me. The other part of it that, that's troublesome for me is that in, in my other life, I, I uh, in higher education, we often deal with situations where grant money's run out and you're looking at folding something out of a grant into, into fund one. And one of the things that we usually look for in that, because grants are meant to be seed money. I mean, people don't give grants hoping that once the money dries up, the initiative dries up. They want to see it continue. Um, but what we look for is we look for some measure of assessment of effectiveness to see how the addition of this grant funded resource has, has helped um, this, the institution, the organization at this point, in this case the school district. And so it's troublesome for me to raise my hand to something, although I'm sure um, that the, that the um, support that these individuals offer is very important to our students. I would definitely like to see before we wrap something into fund one to be more part of the permanent landscape that we've done some assessment and some evaluation about how it's added and how um, this added um, you know, financial um, responsibility is a necessity moving forward without the grant funding. So I, I, I'm, I'm imagining some of that exists, but I definitely like to see it before we just roll it into fund one. I call it fund one, that's what we call it. Uh, given the questions and concerns that are being raised about this particular appointment, I would like to motion that we table 11.5.1 uh, special services consulting teachers um, until we have some more information and people have an opportunity to have some of these questions answered. Second. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? <laughs> Apparently. Oh, sorry. Active. I was supposed That's to do that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, Unanimous. Okay. All right. So, um, 11.5.2, uh, motion to appoint the Wentworth School lead teachers. So moved. Second. I, I do have one question about this one. Um, sorry, but uh, like the student advocate lead... Um, is listed here as um, a stipend for 3,106. And again, um, in, the, in the collective bargaining agreement, the, the stipend um, for 2018-19 
Um, and we're still um, working with, with the, the former contract because we're still negotiating the contract. But it's for $2,588. So there's a discrepancy. And I don't know if it's a typo. Um, I, I know Kate couldn't be here tonight to answer our questions, unfortunately. But, but there is, again, where if we're voting to support that stipend, um, we're voting for a higher amount of money. It's not a lot, but it's a higher amount of money than what we have bargained in the last negotiating cycle. Can I ask a question? <clears throat> Who, uh, if we tabled this, this specific motion regarding um, lead teachers at Wentworth, what, based on that lack of information, would that cause a disruption in their pay? I'm, I, I would, I, I assume so. Um, again, um, Kate couldn't answer our question in terms of whether or not um, the stipends come out um, each pay period. I'm assuming that they do, because that's usually how stipends work. Um, but I'm also uncomfortable not, not, um, not putting forward all of these learning community lead teachers in, in the schools because those are in the contract and, and they should be they should be paid for that work as as should the student advocate lead but um, probably at the cost that that's in the current contract. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we can make a motion to amend so that it's at the current contract rate and then we can revisit it when Kate's available to add in the extra if there's good reason and it's not an error. Would you like to make that motion? I don't know if I can. I think you just said you can. You can, you can, you can, you can, I can, motion, you can move to amend that. Too. Okay, yeah. move to amend to reflect what I just said. Uh, second. I, I'm super comfortable with that. I don't know what other people feel about that, but I mean, I want, I want these teachers to be compensated for the work they're doing, and I don't want to hold that up um, because of logistics that we could probably very easily fix with, with um, you know, Kate's help. Right. I think that's a, a really excellent um, solution in the meantime. So. Ready to okay. vote? So, all in favor? Sorry, oh, one more sorry. thing. Because I don't know that we know when Kate is going to return, but this is probably something that Rhonda can help with, I would think, right? So, you know, that stipend yeah. amount was the same last year as well. I, I realize that. I, I know that. But um, it's it not, it, it, it doesn't match what, what we negotiated. So, that's logistically. A problem. So. Okay. I just want to know how we're gonna follow up on this. Who are you? Who are you suggest? Who? Yeah, I think. Reach I out think. To her. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Approved. So, can I just clarify again? So, the the way that we've amended this <clears throat> allows for us to um, change that number if need be. Is that correct? The way that we've amended this, my understanding is that Alicia amended it to reflect the amount that is written in the contract and pending information from either Rhonda or Kate. Um, if that number should, in fact, reflect what is printed here, then we could approve that additional amount okay. as a, you know. But this doesn't affect any of the other teachers. No, they're going to they're going to have the correct amount. Okay. Correct. All in favor? <laughs> okay. Um, Eleven point five point three motion to appoint the high school lead teachers. So moved. Second. Are those all consistent? I do not have any problem with with um, <laughs> <laughs> with uh, the logistics of these. These are these all look right. They they um, they match, um, and they're all they're all listed. Yep. Okay. All those in favor? Okay. Um, Eleven point five point four middle school lead teachers. Motion to appoint. So moved. School year. so moved. Second. So I um, did have a, I when I was looking at this um, encore lead teacher didn't make sense to me until I talked to Diane, and um, that is a 
the name that is used for all of the allied arts. So in the contract, it's, it's listed as the allied arts lead teacher. Um, it's called allied arts at Wentworth, but, but they call it Encore. Do you, do you know why, Diane? You said that you, it me. does Dave know why? Oh, uh, play, a play on the arts. Now we know. Yeah. Huh. All right. Um, so moved. We've already said that. Oh. So, <laughs> yes. I, well, I do. This is the discussion part. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I do have, I do have questions um, about the support service leader and the, su the student support lead teacher, which I, I know the student support, I think they both were, they both were also paid last year, um, but they're different than, are they different than lead teachers, like community lead teachers, Diane? So the support services lead um, is, it's like a lead teacher for the whole year, and then And, and also very different responsibilities and the lead teachers as listed in the contract. Because in the contract, the, um, it's the six to eight inquiry lead teacher and then the, also the, um, the allied arts lead teacher and then the three through 12 like community lead teachers. So the, the, the positions that you just mentioned are different than those lead teachers. Right, I can't speak to the, the special services lead mm -hmm. was in place when I came on board. Um, I can speak to, as I said, um, the student support lead, which was a new position that had been added at the beginning of last year because of you know, student enrollment numbers and mm -hmm. um, just the level of 504 meetings or 504 plans that we have at the middle school, right. you know, mm -hmm. 75 or more that really was taking our sister principal um, out of the bit of support. Right. I mean, I, I, I want to be clear that I, I feel like all of, those, all of the, the stipends that aren't necessarily referenced in the contract, it's not that they're, they're not worthy stipends. You know, I, I just want to make sure everyone is very clear about that, but it's just, I feel like what we're paying for stipends needs to r reflect our, our contract. I agree. Um, so I don't know how, I mean, I don't want to, not necessarily saying I advocate for not paying those, paying those, all those middle school stipends out. Um, they're all, they all should be, they all, they all are reflected in the contract except for the support lead teacher and the, the support service leader. We need to fix that in negotiations if that is an investment that the district is making because we need to make sure that what we're doing with stipends matches what is negotiated between the SCA and the school board. Um, so I guess I'm, I mean, I, I could support voting these through and, and dealing with it, um, but it's, it's something that I think we need to address. I'm interested in hearing what other people feel. Are they both new, new positions or no. just the student just support? Just the, just the student support lead, lead last, last, year, last year. The, last year. the support <laughs> services position has been under for years. Yeah. Okay. And again, I can't Yeah. That's the new one that was added last year. So, so, you. thank you. So my, my, my preference, because there is a lot of past practice with this, is to, I would support voting, I, I'm an, I would vote yes on, on those, with the caveat that, that we need to do our diligence 
in negotiations as we continue to make sure that that is reflected accurately because it's not the same thing as as running a team of teachers. It's different. It's different work. It's valuable work and it needs to be, I think, defined appropriately in our contract. Are there so. any other throughout the year stipends of this sort that we would approve that we would find a discrepancy in? Or should we ask Joanne that question to see if to make sure that everything's consistent so we don't run into that problem again and then be sort of out of yeah, I think that's a good question for Joanne. I think, you know, I, I mean, I picked up on it because of, I, I know the contract really well right now, so <laughs> so I picked up on it. Um, but usually, like, they come before us, and so we would notice and do our research on that. Go ahead. I would definitely check with Joanne, but as far as I remember, most of the stipends after the beginning of the year are coaching. Right. Okay. Thank you. Or, um, you know, clubs well. or the theater. Right. I agree with you, Amy. I mean, I think that, you, you know, I, I don't want to disrupt what is practice, but I do think that it should be consistent <coughs> with, the, with the contract. Okay. Are we ready to vote? Yes. All in favor? <coughs> okay. Can I, can I bundle a 11.5.5, 11.5.6, and 11.5.7. Mm -hmm. sure. um, motion to appoint the Eight Corners, <laughs> Blue Point, and Pleasant Hill lead teachers. So moved. Second. All in favor? Okay. 11.5.8, motion to appoint the Scarborough Central Certification Committee. Are these all in line, Amy? Can oh, you? So, so moved. moved. <laughs> Second. <laughs> Discussion. What, what, yeah. is, what is this? They, this, this, is a, this is a committee that helps with all the recertification work of all of our teachers. It's a ton of work. It, it keeps track of <laughs> courses that teachers are taking, all of the recert credits they're earning. And the, um, the, there's two people who are doing, the, they're co-chairing it, so they're splitting that stipend. And then there's also some support um, people um, within each building, so each phase each phase level has a representative to help support that work. It's a it's a hefty job, and we're lucky that people are willing to do it because I don't think it's all that fun to do. And just Amy, to be clear, we have we pay one stipend for someone to be a co-chair, and then they also re receive the stipend for be for being their building representative. Well, it's different people. Um, oh, except no, for except, oh no, it's not. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, yes. So there's sorry. There's there's co. We pay. There's a co-chair stipend that they split, and then so they're kind of chairing the whole district, and then within the within the um, phase level, they're also there so the support people within that phase level. So yes, so they're getting the co-chair and the representative stipend if they're. We may not have an answer to this at the table, but I'm just wondering if these were different people. So if if, well, if Lisa and same. Jude, I, right? If they were different people, would they would these stipends look differently? Would we have six individuals here with the same amounts, or is it a little bit less for the co-chair because they're also being paid to be on this committee as members? Well, the co-chair, the co-chair, the co-chair is there just splitting the stipend in half. Okay. So the, the chair stipend is $2,278, or the advisor or representative stipend is 1449 because two people are splitting that chair responsibility, they're dividing it in half. So let me rephrase that. I, thank you. But So the co-chairs have to also be the building rep, a building rep, right? No. no. They don't they're, have to be. Those they are different jobs. They are, but they don't have to be. Okay. The chair that was there resigned after she was a school teacher here. She was kind of Back last year, and do it one more year. Yeah. Even though she had resigned, she's no longer. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and nobody came up this year, so two of these really had to offer to do it. Okay. They're the last person that sees a certification before it goes to the state, and so they've got it. Like I said, it's Thank it's you. a big job and not so much fun. So I'm I'm <laughs> I'm not I'm not surprised that these 
wonderful people are um, willing. I mean, they're doing it. Pulling double weight. They, they are. They're po they're doing double duty for sure. Okay. okay. I just wanted to make sure. Perfect. Thank you. All in favor? <laughs> All right. So. Can we bundle the rest of them as well? And there aren't any issues from my perspective unless somebody else has, has some concerns. So 11.5.8, 11.5.9, 11.510, 11.511, and 11.513. Motion to appoint these extracurricular positions. Maybe I think, I think you need to amend eight. that. You need to start with 11.5.9. Oh, sorry. Sorry. No. 11.5.9, high school Oak Hill Players Music Director. 11.5.10, high school assistant fall cheering coach. 11.511, middle school athletic liaison. 11.512, middle school fall coaches. And 11.513, district wide school psychologist. Um, six tenths of a position. So moved. Second. All in favor? Okay. 12.0, motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. <laughs> Second. All in favor? No. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.